All right, let's walk around to the front. I'm a carriage driver. And talk about a couple of things. Around this hedge, on the other side of this hedge, is our orchard. And we replanted our orchard. We knew from letters and diaries that they raised pears and peaches, figs, they had cherries, and they had apples. John McMurrin, who established this estate, was from Pennsylvania. And he always complained that he couldn't get a really good apple here in Natchez, not like the kind he knew in, as a boy in Philadelphia, in, in McConnellsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, but let's also talk about this house. This is a brick house, and typical of the fashion of that day, they covered the front and the back that's protected by the porches. The facade, the front and the back elevation, they covered that in stucco and the columns. And then they scored it to look like blocks of marble and had an artist come in and he faux painted all of this. Hmm. So this house in 1909 was painted white. Stucco parts were painted white. But we knew from photographs that this is how it looked originally. So we had a local artist come back and faux paint it as it would have appeared originally. Why? Why did they do that in the mid 19th century? Because marble was too expensive. Marble was too expensive. This is house is called, it is called in the architectural style, Greek Revival. Our country had been founded on kind of like as a democracy. So we looked to ancient Greece and Rome as kind of inspiration for architectural models. So you wanted your house to look like an ancient Grecian temple that was covered in marble. So you stuccoed it and then had this artist come in and make it look like marble. It didn't fool anybody. <laughs> Nobody drove up and said, wow, John McMurrin's covered his house in marble. We're in the rural Mississippi. They knew there wasn't any marble around. They knew he wasn't that rich. It was a popular technique that we find on most houses in Natchez, okay? So we recreated this uh, a couple of years ago. So let's walk around to the front. Our artist that recreated this faux finish left some places for you to see the original brush strokes yeah. from 1848. Yeah. So this is the original painter's brush stroke who did the original faux painting on this house from 1848. So you see it here, here. And this would have been the domain of Charles. You. So Charles. Charles. So Charles. So Charles. So Charles. You're the carriage driver. So what would your duties include? Driving the carriage. Driving the carriage. Be taking care of the carriage, taking care of the horses perhaps. Running errands. Picking people up maybe at the Natchez Landing and bringing them home. So let's talk about that carriage drive that Charles would be driving. Um, and let's talk about this landscape. This is very important. We talk about planters seeing themselves kind of as English, uh, kind of on par with the English aristocrats. This is very much an English landscape. You have this formal area around the house, then on the other side of the fence is a meadow. The parkway that you see in front of the house did not exist until the 1950s. The gate that you came through today originally sat at the end of the street. You would have come down from Monmouth, you would have come down the street, and you would have come into the front gate of Melrose. This house was never meant to be seen from a public right-of-way. Very private. You turned into the gate, you got your first glimpse of the house over that wonderful ornamental pond with all those cypress trees, and then the house kind of disappears from you as you come through the winding drive. And then you come up to that white gate, and Charles would have been driving the carriage and would come up, and the house rears up in front of you. So it's kind of like, we're going to tease you with it, take it away, and then give it right back to you full-fledged. Charles, you would have brought the carriage up to the front, dropped everybody off, and then what would you have done? Turn the carriage around in this little circle right here. Come back. You see that break in the hedge? You would have driven the carriage through that break and taken the carriage back to the stable and to the carriage house. If you didn't have anybody, you'd just been sent in to run errands, You'd come through the white gate and gone straight back to the carriage house, not coming up to the front of the house here, okay? Uh, these, most of these magnolia trees were planted by the McMurrins. Um, an architect who visited this property said this estate was English all over. 
flanked by large forest trees. And the Merns are the ones who probably planted all of these magnolia trees that you see on the property today. We know for a fact that Mr. McMurrin planted this magnolia tree to commemorate their anniversary. Mrs. McMurrin's letters often say, I'm sitting at my desk looking out at the magnolia tree my husband planted to commemorate our anniversary. When the house was finished, some people said it was the best, finest brickwork on a house in the Mississippi. Some went even far as to say it was the finest brickwork on a house in the American South. It's in its original condition. This house has never been repointed. Mm. Pretty amazing. Mm. So, so was the brick? The brick made in this area? Was, but he didn't make it locally. It was, I mean, on site, uh -huh. as some places did. He bought it from a brickyard over on St. Catherine's. It's the name, they got the brick. Yeah, they got the brick. And it was always the red brick? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. so think about this. We're taking an inexpensive material like stucco and faux painting it to make it look like what? Marble. Marble. Something rich. So the house is entire cypress construction. Why? Plentiful and cheap. Plentiful and cheap and impervious to insects. So what else are we going to find? Every surface in the house, like this front door, is cypress. Faux painted to look like oak. There again, cheaper to hire someone to come in and faux paint the wood than it is to import oak and walnut or marble, as you'll see in the front part. Are these cypress? Yes. There is some, uh, we might see some uh, part pine construction here, but for most, most of the house it is, is cypress. Mm -hmm. Is that is cypress a hardwood? Yes. Yeah. So the house is about 16,800 square feet. Uh, ceiling heights downstairs are about 14 and a half. Upstairs they're a little shorter at 12 and a half. Notice the baseboard painted to look like walnut. You're standing on a reproduction of the original floor cloth that was installed in this house in 1840-48. What is this floor cloth? It's your mid-19th century linoleum. It's canvas, stretched canvas, faux painted, in this case to look like marble, then shellacked, and then rolled down and cut in place. So we had this manufactured so we could bring large groups in, but you can see the original that's underneath this, right over here. And that was the original. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was a vinyl? Uh, it's kind of similar to vinyl or similar to linoleum. It's, it's, it's a canvas. It's a canvas. It is a canvas. Yeah. And then they, when they slot to that, they were with it. Right. Okay. Yeah, and if you think about it, this is conco, a fan, um, did we have anybody on our list that's got an age next to your name? I do. Okay. Who? You are? Celia. Yeah. Celia? You're 14. Yeah. And Celia and? Lauren. Lauren. Oh, my God. I'm 10. I know right. So that's there are five India. children, Celia, Henry, Rachel, Lauren, and a younger child. One of your duties would have been to stand over there with the rope, and pull the fan that cool people on the dining room table. Wow. A lot of people say, oh, that kept the flies off. No, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't have kept flies off. The little uh, object that you see under that pier table, little round vase thing that's sitting right there, uh -huh. it has a hole in the bottom of it, and you would have poured honey or molasses or syrup under that, and the flies would have gone under that and crawled in and gotten stuck in the honey or molasses. Hmm. Now, granted, you had to sit and eat your meal listening to flies dying in the honey. <laughs> <laughs> but that was better than having them swarm around your food. Um, well, why did a kid have to do the fan? Who was sitting there at the table? The, the rest of the family? The family. But the little five slave children were over there pulling that rope. Oh, slave, slave children. children. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't God. think the children yeah. did it. Yeah. that now. So, Mr. McMurrin, an attorney... Um, leaves his law office, comes home for the two o'clock meal every day, have a big meal, big, big noon day, I mean, two o'clock lunch, big dinner. After he gets up from that, he pushes himself away from the table, walks a couple of steps, collapses on that sofa, and takes his afternoon nap. Yeah. Naps were real big uh, in that time of the day. Um, we have 400 pieces of the McMurrin's uh, china in our collection today. It's English. A lot of the furniture that you see in this room came from Philadelphia. 
You weren't anybody in Natchez if you didn't say, I've got a Cornelius and Baker light fixture in my house. Mm. As I said, this always burned whale oil. Mrs. McMurrin's parents downtown had uh, gas lighting as early as the 1830s, but they had whale oil out here because mm. they would have had to have their own gas plant. Was whale oil not real smoky or just? It was just the best at that time. The best of that yeah. time, yeah. Uh, portraits here, um, as I said, 1866, the McMurrin cell um, to the Davises. Uh, George and Elizabeth Davis have two daughters. One that lives and survives, that's Julia, and Frances, this, their daughter, who died. And this is probably a portrait painted of her after she's dead. Beautiful. Is it recent? No, and we're about to have this uh, redone. Wow. Y'all yeah. Yeah. see it? There's a four part. So see the original four cloth, hand painted, hmm. installed in the house probably 1849. Yeah. So a big room for entertaining. Uh, the Me uh, McMurrins were big party givers here in Natchez. The biggest event they had was their daughter's wedding in 1856. Uh -oh. See how easy it is? It looks yeah. so much like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the daughter's wedding had a huge crowd here. Uh, we have a description of the party. Her bridal cakes look, were baked to look like the pyramids of Giza. Oh my God. She had temples at each end which made out of sugar, one with a dolphin's mouth that dispensed wine and the other with champagne. Mm. Several hundred guests here, but that was probably the biggest party. And this, of course, would have been where they entertained, dancing and that kind of thing. All this right here is ha was hand painted when this house was built. Okay. Who are you? Got two. That's cheap. Marcellus. Well, we didn't talk about Marcellus. We didn't talk about Marcellus. Marcellus was the waiter in the dining room. Very important guy. He was the waiter at the table at the dining room. And who are you? Rachel. Rachel. Rachel, the cook. Uh -oh. Gosh, guys, I missed y'all in the dining room. That's you were it. making the food that Marcellus was serving. In the, all right, we'll catch you up with the service. Out to the kids. You already done Miles. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You're Maurice. Maurice. Tim Wesley. Did you get two? Uh, no, my husband was Wesley. Okay. 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 Well, I hate to tell you this. He died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wesley and, and Laura and Maurice, uh, the only thing we know about them is they're buried in this slave oh. I hate to tell you that. They you, were. Your story here is short. It was very important. Bill Jones. Ah, Bill Jones is upstate. Well, no, great. On these volumes, in the in the uh, library, there's a little red volume with gold stamps on its back. One of the most popular authors in the mid 19th century was Sir Walter Scott, mm -hmm. and he wrote a poem called "The Lay of the Last Minstrel" that is set at Melrose Abbey in Scotland. Ah. Mrs. McMurrin's favorite poem, hence the name of the estate, Melrose. Mm. 1854, McMurrin's had made a ton of money on their cotton crop. Let's go to Europe. Who goes with it? Bill Jones. Mr. McMurrin's enslaved ballot. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Strange that he's not only Bill Jones later, but on the passport application, it says William Carroll. But he's married to Eliza. And Eliza was a house uh, made here, and probably Mrs. McMurrin's made. Oh, this is Eliza. Are you Eliza? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. So Eliza and Bill uh, were a couple here, married. Um, we had two slave weddings that we know of here, Patrick and Mimi. Anybody Patrick or Mimi? And then uh, Marcellus marries an enslaved woman at Mama, Viola who'd been a bridesmaid at Patrick and Mimi's wedding. And we have great accounts of them. They would not have been married in this house. Don't make any mistake about that. They would have been married out, probably uh, out of the lawn somewhere, out by the two slave cabs. Okay, y'all ready to go upstairs? Oh, so McMurrins have two children that survived. John, their son, and Mary Elizabeth, their daughter. Both of them married in 1856. I talked about Mary Elizabeth's wedding reception here. Her first child, Farrah, named Farrah Connor, named for his father, was called Fozzie, kind of a nickname, is born with a club foot. And so he first couple of years of his life, he is wheeled around the estate in this little carriage 
the Mammy Helen. Did anybody get Mammy Helen? Great. So Mammy Helen takes care of John and Mary Elizabeth when they're children. As they get older and don't need her anymore, she's in charge of taking care of the five enslaved children that are here. And then once they come back and marry and they start having children, John and Mary Elizabeth, then she comes back into her role as the Mammy Helen for their children. McMurrin's life is very sad. They have those two children, both of whom marry in 1856. Out of the seven children, that their grandchildren that they have, four die during the Civil War period. Um, their son joins the Confederate Army, um, even though his father, Mr. McMurrin, is a Unionist and goes off to fight. The daughter-in-law's husband joins the Confederate Army. He suffers a head wound. His mind is described as being in a cloud. Um, by 18, 1864, federal troops are here. Mr. McMurrin, being from Pennsylvania and a Unionist, takes the oath of allegiance that allows him to sell his cotton on the open market in 1864. He has saved his 1861 cotton crop. He makes $140,000 on that one cotton crop in 1864. Pays off a lot of debt and then does the smartest thing that he's ever done. Invest the balance in New York Central Railroad stocks and bonds. Mm. That money will see Mrs. McMurrin almost to the end of her life. But their lives have changed. Their son and his wife have gone to Maryland to be with her family. McMurrin's decided, let's sell. Let's just get out of here, go back to Maryland to be with our son. They are left here with their daughter's one remaining child. His father's non compass can't take care of him, so they have their daughter's one son. Mr. McMurrin gets on a steamboat, going to, back, going to New Orleans to transact some last minute business before they go to Maryland. The steamboat explodes shortly before it gets to Baton Rouge. He's fished out of the water, has a broken hip. They don't realize he also has internal injuries. He dies shortly before Mrs. McMurrin reaches his bedside in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. At that point, she's not going to Maryland. She moves into a house that her parents live in across the road at Woodlands, and she will live there until her death in the 1890s. Very poignant in that most of her letters after that will say things like, I'm sitting on the porch of Woodlands looking across the road at the great estate my husband and I created in the 1840s and 50s when we had such high hopes and expectations. Mm -hmm. So McMurray's story here is tragic. Thinking about that, let's go upstairs very quickly and we'll take a run through the bedroom. They moved in here in 48, right? Mm -hmm. They moved in here in In the house in 48. Yeah. Same floor plan upstairs that you have downstairs. Um, but Melrose being very advanced at its time for a house in the deep south. It was there. Um, when you go outside, look back at the top of the house and you'll see we have a balustraded deck. Underneath that deck are 16 little windows. Each operate on an individual pulley. Raise the pulley, those windows will up operable. So when you open all the windows and the doors in the house, the hot air is drawn through the house and out those little windows. And I know you're all thinking, why is this house so dark? I know, it's right. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons is, uh, to be honest, is that we close these shutters during hurricane season. Uh -huh. And our staff hasn't had time to reopen them. We're kind of short-staffed in our maintenance division right now. So, uh, but think about it. In this house, the shutters would have been closed because you want to keep the sun out and have the house as cool as possible in the Mississippi summers. So it would have looked a lot like this during the daytime. Uh, one thing I want to point out to you is this little sewing table right here in the front. A few years ago, we got a call from one of the McMurrin descendants, and he said, I want to give you all a couple of things. Uh, one is Judge Turner's day bed. Remember, Mrs. McMurrin's father was the Supreme Court Justice in Mississippi. So you want to get the day bed. And he said, I've also got this little sewing table and I want to give that to you if y'all want it. And so we said, do we, you know, they sent us a picture of it, and our superintendent says, do we want this? And I said, yes, we do. And she said, well, why? And I said, because we have the daughter-in-law's letter that says, I was sitting at my Chinese sewing table the day Natchez was shelled by federal troops oh, in 1862. Wow. So we know that she was sitting there working at her sewing table, hearing cannonballs fall in the aunt's house next door and all around the property. Luckily, Melrose was not struck by any of that. So, very important for us to have that. Once you're done with the nursery, this last week, I'm going to rip out this bathroom. They asked me if you wanted it, and I went over there and saw, yes, it was. And the room that you saw in 1858. Hmm. never had anything like that, but they would have eventually gone with something like that. Rain check. 
<laughs> Remember using the outhouses when I was a kid. I had to walk out of the house and go to the outhouse. Had a dirt floor. And also the well, you had a pump to get water and carry the water inside the house. What did y'all use for toilet paper? Uh, newspapers. Did, did anybody ever fall through the hole? No, not I know of. Did it stink? <laughs> yes, it stinks. A lot of flies? Yeah. Did y'all use the bathroom together because they have like four stalls in there or whatever? I just remember going in by myself. Because you only had one seat. We might have had two. I can't remember. Yeah, I think. But yeah, it had to, it was probably, man. Probably heard that fence from my house. Wow. Yeah, we had to walk a pretty good ways because you kept it away from the house because it's dunked. Yeah. <laughs> These are the rocking chairs that we used a long time ago. You, you go sideways and you can do it with your legs or with your hands. I like this rocking chair. This would be cool named Charlie Davenport, an accordion to the way. I figures I ought to be nearly a hundred years old. Nobody knows my birthday because all my white folks are gone. I was born one night and the very next morning my poor little mammy died. Her name was Lucindy. My pa was William Davenport. When I was a little mite, they turned me over to the granny nurse on the plantation. She was the one that tended to the little nannies. She got a woman to nurse me that had a young baby, so I didn't know no difference. Any woman who had a baby about my age would wet nurse me, so I grew up in the quarters and was as well and as happy as any other child. When I could tote taters, they'd let me pick them up in the field. I always hit a pile away where one could get them and roast them at night. Old Mammy nearly always made a heap of dewberry and cinnamon wine. Us little tykes would gather black walnuts in the woods and store them under the cabins to dry.